Break a leg. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Julio Godinez, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar, Managing API Security at Scale with Glue and Tyke, brought to you by Glue and Tyke. <laughs> we have a great web webinar for you today, but before we get started, I need to go through some quick housekeeping announcements. Today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any part of the webinar, you will be able to access the recording for on-demand viewing. We will be sending out a link to access webinar on demand, or you can visit devops.com slash webinars. We want to hear from you, so please feel free to send in your questions at any time throughout the program by using the Q&A tab. We also uh, encourage discussion in the chat tab, so let us know uh, your thoughts or just say a quick hello. Uh, if you look in the handout section, you'll see links to access uh, an introductory guide to modern API security management, as well as a uh, how to secure APIs according to Glue guide. Uh, we do have a few polling questions during today's event, so we'd appreciate it if you could take a couple of seconds to, su to submit your answers when you see those come up on your screen. Finally, <laughs> stick around until the end because we are doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards, so stay tuned to see if you're a winner. And joining me today is Mike Schwartz, CEO and founder, Glue, uh, Buddha uh, Bhattacharya, product evangelist, Tyke and Sedki <laughs> Abu uh, Shamala, Solutions Architect, also at uh, Tyke. And with that, mm -hmm. I'm going to put myself on mute, turn off my camera, and let you begin. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, as you can see, we've got a full panel today talking about all things API security. So uh, hello and welcome uh, from whichever part of the world you are. I see some of you have already started putting in uh, the place, your location. So feel free to do so. I think it'll be really, really good to know where our audience is going to be from. I am Buddha. I'm a product evangelist here at Tyke. I'm going to be joined here today by Sedki and Mike, and the introductions will be coming shortly. Uh, the topic of today's discussion is going to be around managing API security at scale with Tyke and Glue. So we are in for an exciting session. Um, I'm going to go back into my slides. And head on over with what we're going to be covering today. I'm hoping everyone is able to hear me properly. Everyone's able to see my screen properly as well. All right, moving on. So we are going to be starting off with introductions. Like I said, we will introduce Glue to you, who's a leader in modern digital identity, um, followed by introduction to Tyke. Uh, it's a leading API management platform. And then we'll dive straight into panel discussion where we'll be talking about a few things around API management as well as API security, hopefully to ease some of your concerns, answer some of your questions. And uh, well, if what we cover is not enough, then you will have an opportunity to ask your own questions as well. There is no time limit in terms of when you can ask those questions. You can ask those questions at any point during the entire session. If you uh, look to the right, there is a Q&A slash chat section. Feel free to break keep your questions coming in, and uh, we will address them as we go along. So, um, okie doke, I think that is about it. Let's move on to who we have in the panel. I think we've already done the introduction, although I have to say uh, hearing my full name sometimes can be a little bit weird, because <laughs> not quite often, to be honest, uh, but I am Buddha, a uh, product evangelist here at Taik. On to what we're going to be talking about today. So just to set the scene a little bit, um, we are looking at a world which is more and more skewed or moving towards the API first product. And really, when we talk about, when we think about APIs, when we think about the modern product stack, we think about uh, development and designing of APIs, which is great. It is an important step. It is, an, it is a critical step to get right. However, we are here to tell you today that that is only the first step in the journey of an entire life cycle of uh, API management, especially if you're looking to um, bring that out, push that out, make it available for consumption, whether for businesses, whether for enterprise or whether for consumers directly. So there is a few other steps to come before you can get to that point, um, including API security, thinking about scalability, thinking about stability and as well as observability. And if you're in one of those uh, verticals which is compliance heavy, then you might need to consider standards and compliance requirements as well. So just to give a little bit of a look at what an a typical API lifecycle management journey sort of looks like, uh, you have two key stakeholders here who will be your API providers. These are people who are building these APIs and making it available for consumption. 
and the other side of the spectrum, which is essentially the API consumers. And of course, creation and designing of APIs is essential. However, there is also steps around securing those APIs, managing them better, uh, publishing those APIs, um, mon uh, monitoring them, optimizing them, consuming them, and discovering them. So there's a whole range of activities that goes around in order to make a successful API-first product. Um, so that is where Tyke comes in. And we will hear a little bit more about that as we move along. Having said all of that, one of the most critical elements of API lifecycle management is actually security. Because once you have built out those APIs, like I said, you are building these APIs for consumption, whether internally or externally. And you need to make sure that these APIs, which is essentially interacting with all of the data, all of the systems that you possess or you might have in your stack, you need to do that in a secure manner, whether that is to do with access control, whether that is to do with uh, authentication, authorization, we'll go through all of that. These are critical elements. Now you would think that because APIs are so ubiquitous in the modern digital landscape, API security should be standard, should be predictable, should be easy, and everyone knows how to do it well. Well, that doesn't seem to be the case at the moment. And hopefully what we intend to bring out during this session is um, some of the key challenges, some of um, the different terminologies that are associated with API security, some of the key challenges associated with doing things right, and what it would take for an organization to go from small scale, especially when you're scaling up to larger organizations. What are the different things that you, can, you need to consider? What are the different pitfalls and um, how you can use something like Tyke and Glue to hopefully make your life a little bit easier? So that is pretty much the pitch for me for this session. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to head on over to our two guests, and um, I'm going to start off with uh, Glue. So we've got identity and access management with Glue. I am going to switch back over to Mike. So hello and welcome, Mike. Glad to have you here with us. So tell us a little bit about uh, Glue and what, what you do. Thank, thanks, Buddha. Uh, I'll keep this really short so we can get to the content. Uh, Glue is about a dozen years old now. We have a free open source identity platform called the Glue Server. And uh, uh, enterprises use this for a single sign-on, for for, to issue tokens for API access management, for two-factor authentication. And we are really committed to open source. So there's an upstream project at the Linux Foundation called the Janssen Project. Um, and that um, is governed um, by a steering committee at the Linux Foundation. Um, and Glue is, you could say, the, the, um, the downstream um, commercial product um, where we take this open source so software and we make a, a supported um, product that enterprises can consume with it. And I'm, I'm really excited um, to talk about this topic because we see that, um, you know, a APIs are everywhere. It's the backbone of the economy and um, how to use and how there are some tricks that we think we can share about how you can use OAuth to achieve more scalable security. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you so much, Mike, for the introduction. And like you say, security and having that predictability when it comes to, you know, we know that our APIs are secure and that form such a solid foundation when you're thinking about scaling out to say from a hundred to a thousand to maybe a million users I mean, having that level of trust and uh, well faith in your system makes goes a long way in essentially building out robust systems on the long run so thank you so much for the introduction looking forward to the discussion on to Setki. hello and welcome Setki. Um, thank you over to you for an intro to tyke Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Very excited to be here, uh, especially alongside uh, 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 Mike here as a juggernaut and uh, Buddha moderating. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to the discussion for sure. So uh, my name is Sedki. I'm a solutions architect here at Tyke. And uh, what that simply means is I have the, 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 the pleasure to be able to sit down with many, many companies across a, a whole bunch of verticals from startups to enterprises and hear all about their API strategy as, as mature or as immature as it sounds across a wide variety of APIs from GraphQL to gRPC to REST, hosted uh, serverless or in Kubernetes on-prem uh, across the board. And so um, 
I, uh, uh, I'm exposed to a lot of different uh, patterns uh, and definitely here to talk about uh, what some of the healthier ones look like and uh, possibly some of the unhealthier ones. And, and uh, yeah, hope, hope we can get a lot of value out of this. So, and like Glue, uh, we here at Tyke, uh, our bread and butter, our API gateway is also open source. Uh, so we're very proud of that. It's the same gateway that we use across the board. The, our enterprise customers use it on-prem. It's the same one in our cloud uh, for, for our tight cloud SaaS. Uh, so we're, we're very proud of that. Um, so yeah, uh, over that, back to, uh, back to you, Buddha. Awesome. Thank you so much. And again, looking forward to the discussion. I think we'll jump right into uh, what I call the next section is going to be around defining terminologies. It's almost like a fire uh, side chat in this case, where we are really starting to set the base around the different terminologies that people would come across in the world of API security, maybe even the world of API management. And most often, more often than not, they get it wrong. So I think we're going to try and sort of demystify this a little bit and hopefully bring some clarity as we move along. Uh, and do remember, um, people in the audience, if you have questions during any of this session throughout, you have the right, you have the privilege to actually ask these questions in the chat. And I will pick them up as we move along um, during the entire session. So. Without further ado, moving on to our first question. So this is our terminology de definition round. And I think I'm going to start off with something that comes across very, very often when we talk about API security. And this tends to be authentication, authorization. Now, typically, anytime you think about API security, these are the two terminologies that come straight up. And usually, people use them interchangeably. That is one of the things I'm assuming we're going to be addressing here. And the other thing is, in a lot of times, there is an oversimplification of what the definition of authentication authorization is. So um, I think maybe I'll start off with Setkey first in terms of authentication sure. authorization. Uh, are they interchangeable? If not, how would you define authentication authorization? Yeah, thank you. So uh, my favorite analogy uh, for this is to go to the bank teller uh, uh, analogy. So uh, imagine that you are you walk into a bank uh, and then you ask for uh, a bank balance. And so authentication is who you are. Uh, so I am said key. I present an ID. That ID will tell the bank that I am said key, and then they can use that to look up my accounts. Um, that's authentication is who you are. Authorization is what you're allowed to do. Uh, and so uh, just because I'm said key, I presented my ID and I've proven that I am who I say I am, doesn't mean that I have access to Mike's account or to Buddha's account. Uh, so uh, not interchangeable at all, completely separate. Um, uh, yeah, I will leave it that simple. I know that there, it can go deep, <laughs> but I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Mike, if you if you have any. Yeah, I, think, I think I think that's that's kind of the general definition that we usually get. Like this is OK. When you're starting off, this is kind of what you need to know about it. However, I think, Mike, according to your latest blog, you do mention around going a little bit deeper, <laughs> like not just about the person, but you go into the depth of what identity really means. So on to you, Mike. Right, right. Sometimes we forget about the software acting on our behalf. Um, so authentication, who you are, authorization, what you're allowed to do. But it's not actually you because you don't speak TCP IP or HTTPS. Um, we have to use these, like the software gets between us and like the, the systems that we're interacting with. And so we talk a lot about the client. So this is generally a mobile um, application or a website that we're using. And this client um, is acting on our behalf. And we also need to authenticate the client. So in, a, in the simplest use cases, you might see API key and secret. Um, but um, it gets maybe the client might also use a, private, a cryptographic authentication technique, like a private key and a public key. Um, so I would say who the authentication is um, the person, the software. And the third part of authentication that we don't want to forget about is the server that you're talking to uh, when we are most the best practice today is to always use HTTPS when we're calling APIs. And that HTTPS is actually the, um, the, ser the way that the server is being authenticated uh, because the, the client is, uh, we, needs to verify that it really is the right server that I'm talking to. And so don't forget that the server also gets authenticated. And that happens via TLS when you make that HTTPS connection. Right. Absolutely. Thank you so much. That is that is essentially the, the two step that we wanted to get into. So I think that sort of clarifies a lot of the, the baseline conversations around authorization and authentication. Definitely not something to be used interchangeably. They are two different things to solve <laughs> very different purposes. 
All right. <laughs> Next one that we move on to is pretty much the foundation of any API security, especially when we're talking system to system communication, or even I think client server communication in this case, is the concept of trust. And it may, at the face of it, sound like, oh, trust. Yeah, you need to be able to trust the system. That's a no-brainer. But in the world of API security, that has very, very far-reaching implications. It is essentially the foundation of everything that we build upon. So I'm going to go to you, Mike, in this, in terms of if you were to define or describe trust in the world of API security, how would you go about doing that? Yeah, you know, it's the most elusive property of the internet because from the internet enabled us to connect to each other really easily. If I know your IP address, I can connect to you, but I can't really tell who that person is on the other side or whether I should trust them. And and this has really been a challenge that, you know, for the last 30 years, we've, we've has been fundamental to the internet. And I think trust is really important in the API ecosystem because based upon the type of client that we have, we might we have different levels of trust. Um, so, for example, if I if I have an API, and I know that this API is going to be called primarily by developers who are internal to my organization, that's one level of trust. But if this API will be consumed by third parties, it's a different level of trust. And and how we vet those those um, third parties becomes very important to how much we can trust them and so yeah so this it sort of opens up um, a really important um, um, aspect of of, um, api security which is how do we issue these client credentials when i give you this api key in secret um, i'm allowing you to identify yourself and based upon that authentication i'm um, going to give you certain privileges or permissions and which permissions I give you, um, and it really how you get those credentials in the first place is the origin of that trust. Right, got it. Uh, Setki, anything to add to that before we move on to the next one? Um, no, I, I mean, I, if anything, a question, because uh, so it's really interesting. Uh, Mike, you mentioned right there is um, is being able to give privilege and action. And, and so I guess my question back to you, Mike, would be how much of that process is automated? Because uh, it's a question that comes across uh, my plate all the time. Uh, people want to automate everything these days, you know, uh, and just to throw some buzzwords, you know, there's GitOps, there's infrastructure ops and infra- infrastructure as code and all this. Just to dial down specifically on security for a second, um, and, and privilege, how much of this is an automated process? How much of this is, is somebody going in and, and, and looking at data and checking off boxes? So a really good example of, of uh, one approach to trust is to look at OpenID Connect. Um, mm-hmm. OpenID Connect defines a automated way to get client credentials um, called dynamic client registration. Um, it's also an, an OAuth standard now. And so um, so a client can call an API and say, give me, you know, an API key in secret, or here's my, here's my public key. Um, in OpenID Connect, um, a, m- most implementations um, have sort of a, a, a low level of trust by default. Um, so when I, um, when I get client credentials, if, if, if we don't know who this client is, and the client's open to the internet, so anyone can get client credentials, <laughs> right? So Mm -hmm. the default level of trust is normally um, almost nothing. Like we'll tell you, Mm -hmm. we won't even tell you the person's email. We'll just tell you this is a user in our domain because that's not releasing any uh, personal or or correlatable information. Um, But to step up from there is where where we have, we start to have challenges. Um, So, and how you automate trust, it really depends on um, what I would say is the ecosystem. And and by by formalizing the ecosystem, you can you can achieve greater levels of trust. So a good example here would be open banking ecosystems. So mm-hmm. in these ecosystems, um, the banks register with a with a with a regulator, and then if you're a mm-hmm. fintech application who's writing, let's say, an app that wants to display somebody's checking balance, uh, that they also register with the regulator, and then the regulator vets these participants and issues what's called a software statement. It's like a JWT that you present during registration. Um, so the, when the bank sees that registration request, they can see the JWT and say, oh, this is a 
um, a, a, a fintech company that's been vetted by the regulator, I can therefore give them this amount of trust. So that's just an example um, of a strategy that you can use to, um, to automate trust. But how you do that, um, there's, there's, it really depends on the business and the ecosystem. So any level mm-hmm. of automation can be achieved, um, but there has to be a business process because uh, trust sense. is not a technical problem. Mm-hmm. It's a business. It's a business challenge. A, <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Business yeah. Problem. We see. Uh, we, we see on both sides of the spectrum. Because uh, so typically with API management, you, you're you're absolutely correct. Is that businesses are approaching the problem holistically. Um, there are examples of of somebody that needs an API gateway for a point and click solution. Uh, but uh, typically for API management, is you look at your API ecosystem as a whole and you say, okay, so how do we how do we centralize this? How how do we make security the number one concern? And so where does that fit in with our uh, end-to-end user experience? So uh, we're building an application. Users are going to be using the application. How do we make it so uh, we can trust that these people are, are who they say they are and then feed that information you know, through the API gateway to an API that's servicing to a, a third-party API and, and, and pass it all back and forth. So there's a lot of different um, vector points there. So I think, I think this, is, this is also one of the areas where I think API management platforms play a pretty critical role, I would imagine. And, you know, pretty much, like you said, centralizing some of these components together so that the, the, the journey and the flow that comes up uh, is, is managed better. It's, it's a bit more um, efficient in terms of how you would go about managing it, perhaps. So, so one terminology, again, that comes up around this and where I think an API, API gateway or API management platform helps out is also this, the concept of uh, separation of concerns. So I wanted to just go to you, Setki, in this in terms of when we talk about separation of concerns, what does that mean? And how does that sort of factor into the world of API management? Sure. Yeah. So, um, so an API management is uh, one, one of the core benefits that you get is decoupling um, the way that your uh, APIs are being built on the back end um, from how your clients are interacting with them, right? Because so if you can visualize it, you have three parties. You have the client. Uh, Mike keeps referring to that's the thing that it's not an actual person. The person uses the client, which is a mobile app some website, a single page application, things like that. That's your client. It's it's calling your APIs through the, the, the API gateway. And so what you have is this, this doorway into your ecosystem where you can present a, a facade and uh, and then and then centralize your API strategy. Uh, so you can you can centralize how your authentication looks, what the authorization uh, looks like as well, of course. Um, you, you can centralize the, the style of the APIs, the protocols being used, and then separate that concern from the back end. And so what happens is in a, in a very mature organization is you empower your developers to pick the language, pick the platform that suits the job. If I'm, if I'm building you know, something with extremely high RPS, I won't, I won't write it in JavaScript. I'll probably write it in Golang or, or you know, C or something like that or Rust. Um, and so on, on the other side, if we're building uh, something that's going to be consumed primarily by client applications, I would consider using GraphQL and so on and so on and so on. And so what you get by being able to use, uh, by, by separating those concerns, is that you empower developers to, to build uh, their APIs how they want and then centralize them. And then from a client perspective, the actual clients that are being built to consume these APIs um, they have uh, they have a single doorway, and, and so they have a very repeatable, very easy to consume API strategy. So I know it's always REST, or it's always GraphQL, or, or, or what have you. And it's always going to be OAuth, or it's always going to be opaque token. Don't shoot me, Mike. Uh, whatever it is, it's uh, it, it's it's everything is centralized. You've separated the concerns from from the client in the back, and so that that's one of the primary um, motivations. And I would, I would also imagine, like especially if you you spoke about the API ecosystem before, and like we're talking about tools that are purpose built for achieving certain objectives. And there could be, you know, mm-hmm. tools purpose built for achieving like identity management with something like Glue, for instance. You could be looking at observability platforms or business intelligence tools that might be actually taking all of the information that is passing through your API management platform and actually making sense of that, helping you make better data-driven decisions. And so all of these different systems are purpose built. And with any of these systems sort of existing, they're essentially contributing to building a product that is actually going to be a success and it's going to deliver value. And that's where I think an API management platform sort of comes in to almost uh, cohesively bring all of these things together, where you're essentially centralizing, like you say, some of this information, but at the same time, making sure that 
the 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 activities the the objectives are also delegated towards platforms that can best possible solve the challenges that they are built to built to solve um so with that sort of a background let's let's move on to the final sort of terminology conversation and i think this is again a very very critical element of um, of of api security i think we we sort of touched upon this previously but let's let's go into a little bit more detail around this and and the terminology we're talking about here is tokens uh, and of course tokens have a few different varieties so we go into those as well so maybe mike if you start off with what a token is and perhaps with examples of you know what a reference token what a value token is um, and then we'll take it from there sure so tokens are um a mechanism for a client to present something to an API that represents an authentication authorization that's happened somewhere else. Um, so most people are familiar with JWTs. Um, this is a, a piece of signed JSON. That it's signed by the OAuth authorization server generally or the OpenID provider. So it's, it's signed by somebody that the API trusts. Um, and can be cryptographically verified as uh, having been issued by, by this trusted party. And that um, information can present useful, or that token pre can present useful information to the API. It can tell you who the client is, what's their client ID. It can tell you scopes. So what does the authoriza OAuth authorization server say that this client is authorized to do? What's their extent of access? Um, it can tell you other information. It can tell you maybe what organization this client is affiliated with or geographic region. So we can stuff a lot of interesting, inf the OAuth authorization server can stuff a lot of interesting information into that access token that can be trusted by the API. Um, what you mentioned before is really important because we have two different types of tokens, um, reference tokens and value tokens. So a value token um, contains the actual JSON payload. So a JWT contains the JSON plus a signature, so it can be verified. Um, and it's great because it's stateless. Um, you're getting the whole package. Um, reference tokens are also useful. So that's just like a random string. Um, mm -hmm. And so this means nothing to the API gateway or to the API if the API gets it directly. So what happens is, is that the gateway will take this, re this reference ID and go back to the AS and say, I have this reference ID, give me the JSON. That's called token introspection, where you're trading the reference ID for the, for the JSON. The JSON would be the same that you get in that JWT. Um, it's a useful strategy um, because reference tokens don't contain any data, whereas value tokens, if leaked, actually contain data. So you could say that reference tokens are more secure um, because once they um, um, once they expire, they're meaningless. Um, sometimes we see a strategy called the phantom token pattern, where reference mm -hmm. tokens are used on the internet, um, where value tokens are used for internal communications. Um, in any case, an API gateway should only do introspection once. It should cache the reference token until it expires so as not to have to do that round trip over and over again. Um, but it, neither one is right or wrong. They're both good in different circumstances, <laughs> is the point I want to make. I, I, and I, I, have, I have a... Sorry, uh, just, just, I was actually going to ask about the use case of this as well. I think you already covered this, where you're using an internal, for the internal cases, you're using one of the tokens and the other one is for external. And I think, is that the typical use case that you see? Or are there other use cases where, you know, you would say, Use, use of value tokens here makes more sense versus use of reference tokens there? Uh, I think it's wishful thinking. I would say it's best practice. Um, and that uh, a lot of, um, a lot of um, um, especially service providers will prefer to use um, JWTs because it reduces the number of round trips that they have to service. So if I issue you a JWT, you never have to come back to me. For large mm -hmm. service providers, that can save like a data center, like that one round trip for introspection mm -hmm. times a billion like round trips could be a data center. So, um, so we see JWTs used on the internet. Um, it ultimately depends upon your transaction value. Maybe it's okay to do that. So we don't want to be paternalistic about security, say what you should or shouldn't do. But if you have, you know, if I was doing something like a banking transaction, I think I would prefer to see my bank using um, opaque tokens um, um, on the internet. Right. 
Right. Setki, you were going to ask something. Sorry, I, I interrupted you. No, I was going to loop it. So yeah, because we talked earlier about authorization, and uh, so I, I'm I'm curious because uh, there's two ways to look at it. I'll, I'll definitely give my perspective on API management. So we, we talked about authorization, and um, and so just kind of thinking about how as as startups are or not even startups as as products are being built, I want to understand from from Mike's perspective as well how. Um, how, uh, w what authorization, if that encapsulates the ability, uh, uh, if, if it, authorization encapsulates uh, user level data, what do I mean by that? So to go back to the bank uh, teller, uh, um, so how do I, uh, is, is, uh, as an API, know if this is um, uh, uh, Sedkey versus Mike versus Buddha, all of that information is the JWT, right? So is it, is it, is it glues? Is it uh, Glue's uh, 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 position to say this API request is not allowed? Is that Tyke as an API gateway, or is that a, a business logic that belongs in, in the API? And I surely have my own answer, but I'm, I'm curious to hear from you, Mike. You know, there's, there's. I think we tend to conflate JWTs, but, but a JW, like I said, a JWT is just a signed piece of JSON, and that JSON can tell you all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. So in OpenID Connect, we have a very special signed JWT called the ID token. And that gives you details about the authentication event, the who, what, where, when, and how of the, um, of, you know, who is this person? Who's the subject? How were they authenticated? Did they use token or, or did they use a, a FIDO key or did they use a password? Um, when were they authenticated? Um, sometimes, you know, you'll see your <laughs> SSO session last for like a forever. You know, maybe you haven't been authenticated to Google in a year. <laughs> um, so when were you right. actually authenticated? So that all that information about the authentication <laughs> event and optionally claims, email address, first name, last name, um, stuff like that, phone number, that might be in the ID token. Um, and that ID token is signed. And that's what we call in the identity space an identity assertion. And if you're familiar with SAML assertions, that's another type of identity mm -hmm. assertion. So in OpenID Connect, we call it the ID token. In SAML, we call it the SAML so, assertion. So th those are, I mean, so yeah, so there's there's many different ways of presenting that information. I, I guess just to answer uh, my own question there, it's about, um, it depends on the use case. Because so what typically happens is people will come to us and say, so uh, they'll ask me, they'll say, uh, he said, what, 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 is, what is typically best practice for how authorization is done? Should we do the user level authorization in the, in the API gateway or in the, in, the, in the API? It's not traditionally done in Glue. Uh, so what, what Glue does and other great IAMs is, is they're responsible for the, uh, uh, so managing the, the resources and, 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 uh, and things like that. And then of course, exchanging those tokens, doing the, the token revocations and, and such. And so by the time, an API is, is being consumed through an API gateway. We have an access token. Uh, and, and so those are really the two places that you can use an, an access token and do the authorization. It's in the API gateway itself or, uh, in, the, uh, um, or in the API. And, and we definitely see both. To your point, Mike, I see pros and cons to both uh, approaches. I've definitely seen both. Um, and yeah, there, there's trade-offs to both. There's really no one way of doing it. Right. Well, let me just say that, um, so the ID token can be sent as part of um, an API request. So we can send, mm -hmm. the access token is generally put in the authorization header. Um, mm -hmm. And by the way, there's no rule that says we can't put information about the user in the access token. It's commonly done. Um, mm -hmm. It's very in useful information. And if we don't want to have to send the ID token as a parameter or as another header or as part of the, so there's nothing that says we can't put, when, when a client sent a user to be authenticated um, and obtained an access token, um, there's nothing that says that we can't put information um, in, the, um, um, in the access token. Actually, we have another token in OpenID Connect called the user info, to user info token. That's generally where we, that's the place that it's supposed to go. But with that said, we see user information stuffed into ID tokens <laughs> and into access mm -hmm. tokens. Um, yeah. There's no right or wrong answers here because um, it, yeah. it depends upon what you're trying to do with your application, what's your um, level, your appetite for risk, um, what, what's your network requirements. So there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. Um, and this is all separate from authorization, though, because this is just mm -hmm. the tokens our input to authorization policy, um, and and we can get into this. There's a, actually this is a this is a deep topic. We could probably have a whole other uh, <laughs> webinar on, but um, but I think it's important to understand okay. that. Remember, the access okay. tokens of JWT 
the ID tokens at JWT and the user info in, um, from OpenID Connect is a JWT, and these can all be used by the API. Right, right. I, I think we'll, we will go into a little bit of a strategic discussion about you know what some of the best practices would be. We'll do that next. But before that, I think there's a question that's come up, and it was something that we were um, sort of discussing previously as well in terms of you know the best sort of best practices around. We spoke about. Uh, you know, tokens existing forever. And I would sure. imagine, assume, and hope that that's probably not the best way to go about it. So what would be the best way to sort of approach, you know, when the expiration of a token should be, what's the maximum, what's the minimum, and then, you know, what what, what is sort of the, the conversation around uh, this particular aspect of uh, the token uh, expiration? So, Mike, maybe you can take this one. Um, sure. So, well, in general, access tokens are short-lived and refresh tokens are long-lived. Refresh tokens can live for months or years. Like, um, you know, if I authorize an app to update my calendar, I maybe wanted to do that forever, and it maybe it has no expiration. Um, the, the pattern that we like to see in OAuth is that a client presents the refresh token at the token endpoint to get an access token, which is short-lived when they need to call that API. Um, the API gateway needs to do need what needs to look at that access token and make sure that it's the first thing you want to know is is this a good access token right now? Um, so that's the most important thing. Is this a good access token? Um, and then the API gateway might also look at the scopes and see you know based upon the scopes should I proxy this request or not? Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's that hard. Um, short access, you know, access tokens. There's an OAuth. Um, you know, says short-lived. I think it's, you know, best practices, five minutes would be a long time. A minute is typical, but you can go even shorter. Maybe you want to only want it to be good for 10 seconds or so. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come up from Andrew, and I think, I think maybe we'll pick that up a little bit later on, I think after we have done with this discussion, because I think that might fit in quite nicely to that. Um, Nathan asks a follow-up to the question around the token lifetime, so maybe we'll pick this up right now. What's the best practice for when a token should be revoked, um, rotate credentials or add token to blacklist, what else? What is sort of the best practice around some of these uh, common practices? Well, I guess it should be revoked when the user says so or the organization that issued it says so. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so if I decided I, you know, I, I authorize some app and, and I don't want them to have access to my stuff anymore, I need to be able to revoke it. That's super important. And likewise, if we're talking in a machine-to-machine -machine use case, and I and I gave a I issued some client or some piece of software an ability to call my company's API, and I find out that that company is a hacker. I want to be able to revoke that um, token as soon as possible. Um, refresh token revocation is really typical. You see, access token revocation um, um, can also be implemented by by platforms. It's not as typical. You know, normally you're setting pretty low lifetimes, um, but it, you know it, it it could still happen. Um, rotate creds, um, you know, this is all, these policies are generally configurable. It's really up to the organization and their, um, when, when, how long they want these things to live. We used to set a default, um, cl a client expiration date of one day in the glue server. It drove developers freaking crazy. Right. And we, we ended up going to defaulting to never. Um, so uh, there's no right, you know, we, at Glue, we like to set things to like be secure by default. But then right. we were like, okay, we, we also want to not drive people crazy. So I don't, I don't know. Good balance. The balance. Answer to that. Good balance, yeah. I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a follow up from Nathan. I think what he's trying to talk about is really um, how do you handle the revocation on the API side? Um, because JWT is still potentially valid. So uh, yeah, I can take this one. Yeah, yeah, I can take this one. So this is uh, this is um, so yeah. So your your an, an API has been um, uh, 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 a client is using an API token, an API uh, JWT to access an API, and so uh, the first trip, the first time it comes in, the API gateway uh, validates that this JWT is is valid, right? It's been signed correctly, it's not expired, uh, and then it does it checks the scopes and make sure that this person can access this, excuse me, this request is allowed access to the things that it's requesting. And so uh, I guess Nathan's question is, um, so on repeated attempts after the initial trip, now that the, uh, a valid and successful um, uh, um, um, uh, chain of uh, requests has come in, what happens after that uh, revocation has happened? And, and so 
typically with an access token, what you want to do is, is have it very short lived. We were actually just talking about this uh, before the call. So you want to have uh, a very short lived access token, right? So it lives for a minute, two minutes, three minutes. And then, um, and then it naturally will just solve itself as a problem when, when the API gets, when the GWT gets exp uh, expired. Uh, what I've seen though, in more secure uh, use cases, so, so imagine a financial transaction, healthcare transactions, is you can build an OAuth revocation uh, check uh, for every single API request. So each time an API is attempted to be used, the API gateway or your API, if you're going straight to the API, will will check that uh, that the JWT is still valid. Um, but of course, there's a significant trade-off in terms of performance, because now, uh, as opposed to being able to just check the cache, uh, the API has to make a full round trip request to the IAM, like Glue, for each and every single API request. So it's a trade-off that you have to ask yourself um, for, um, you know, depending on your use case, depending on your performance requirements, and, and, and so on. So uh, it's, it's a balance that comes down to business use case. Got it. Thanks a lot for the answers. I think uh, we'll move on to the next part. I'm just being mindful of time as well. We'll pick up questions as we move on as well. Um, next up, I think I'm going to be asking probably the most loaded question of this entire webinar at the moment. Um, so I'm just going to spell it out and we'll take it from there. Um, so of course, API security is important. Uh, we've established that hopefully sufficiently by this point of time. So the typical question then comes out to be, at what stage should you start thinking about API security? Probably a loaded question there. Uh, but in terms of, you know, there's, there's this movement around, you know, what used to happen historically mm -hmm. point you're looking at, okay, there is security testing and conversations around this. Um, but now there seems to be a bit of a shift. So at what stage, I think Setki, perhaps you picked this up initially. Um, at what stage do you start thinking about API security? Um, right. And, uh, Mike had a, a funny way to describe this. It's the same question as, uh, what point should developers start writing tests <laughs> very early on? And that's really the question. So uh, let's let's look at if we could snap our fingers and have a best practice and all of our developers in, in our enterprise were doing this, this is what we would have is our, our first, we would start with our API spec. So before a single line of code was written, we would write our API documentation and uh, map out all the relationships between it and all the other APIs. We would have an understanding of what our data model would look like. And then at, at the same time, as we're building it uh, and these relationships are out there, we could now start to think about security. So before a single line of code is written, the security is well mapped out between uh, all of our different APIs. Um, and then, you know, it just becomes a matter of executing on it. So making sure that uh, all of the authorization is sitting in our API gateway, or again, if we don't have an API gateway in each of our APIs uh, has, has the same code. Um, uh, um, that was a subtle attempt to say why an API gateway is, is good to it's good to use, <laughs> um, and, and then just executing on it. Um, so really, the answer is it should security starts at the very beginning. In practice, um, you know, uh, there's a balance between how quick do we, we want to get this feature to market versus a more waterfall approach about thinking of every single edge case. And uh, typically, companies actually fall somewhere in the middle is, is they, they just kind of get to work and, and start throwing stuff out there and then document their APIs. And uh, I was, I was yeah, going to say, not, exactly. Not pretty. yeah, exactly. I was going to say the same thing where, you know, there is, there is always this, this balance between best practices where you definitely want this to be like in the, in a world of, which is a utopia. This is exactly how you would want to go about doing it. However, there's also this conversation around, you know, where we are in terms of the scale of the business and how quickly do we want to, you know, grow up, grow, grow the business and, get features out of the market, get those capabilities in the hands of people, get them testing versus, you know, building something that might take a little bit longer, but but probably creates a, a, a stronger foundation. So that little balance can always be a bit of a challenge there. Um, so that's mm -hmm. why I think moving to the next part of this, when we talk about, because today's conversation is a lot. Sure. Of can, I, can I just uh, add a little bit yeah, to what said, Kisan? So, you know, um, thinking about security, when you're in the design phase uh, might impact um, the endpoint namespace. Um, so you might, and, and Swagger um, or, or open API um, spec um, gives you a mechanism for defining um, OAuth scopes um, um, in, in, your, um, in your API definition. And so um, I think that you might decide, oh, if I had only broke, created a different endpoint in this API, um, I'd be mm -hmm. able to use a different scope. Um, but because they're all stuck behind the same um, endpoint, um, I can't. Mm -hmm. um, so so I, I think um, it's, it, it, 
um, if, if you now Swagger doesn't give you a ton of granularity, but I would highly recommend to use what's what's there as at least like a common denominator approach to OAuth um, security. Right. Okay. Yep. That's, that's that's a really really good point. I think that sort of leads us into how would a an organization that is sort of starting out in the world at the moment start thinking about API security when they are building for scale? Like, what would be the different components of their perhaps their API strategy? And more specifically around API security, how should they approach this? Especially like uh, the topic suggests, we are looking at API security at scale and how do you start thinking about that in an early stage? So Mike, perhaps you could um, take take that up. You know, in the blog that, uh, that we published last week and that's referenced in this, I, I break it into three parts because um, it can be overwhelming. So the three parts I think about are, like we just said, API design. Um, what are my endpoints and what are the methods? And what are the scopes? Just thinking about it, just really at, at more of a coarse grain. So how do I design my APIs? Then the second part I think about are the developers who are going to call this API. So there's a developer portal. How are those developers going to get client credentials? And how are we going to make sure that they have the right permissions? And then the third part is enforcement. Um, so. And this especially ties into the gateway. So now that I've defined what OAuth scopes are necessary, I figured out how to issue the right scopes to the right developers who are writing software. And then how do I make sure that I actually enforce that um, um, in my API gateway? Um, so those are the three parts I would think about. Um, you know, any startup is going to want to build, you know, and iterate. Um, but I think that thinking about those um, three things up front is important because if you oh you, if you you can start off with say you don't need to do private key authentication you know with sign blah 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 encrypted you don't need to do all that but if you at least think about um, you know that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use like API keys which is just like that that's not security um, <laughs> so if, you, if I'm actually going to make sure that I'm going to authenticate clients and I'm going to issue them access tokens, and this isn't rocket science these, these days, um, yeah. you know, I'm going to use present OAuth tokens to, to call my APIs. And like, I would say it's good to um, sort of build to, to future proof your infrastructure and, and try and follow best practices. I want to add to that because uh, uh, the, the the one point there that stuck out to me, I agree with everything and I, I want to just really zero in on why what Mike said was really important is the, so the bit about uh, API tokens being uh, insecure for sure compared to JWTs. And this actually ties into uh, 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 Mahindran's question. Mahindran asked, which component responsible for generating tokens, JWTs, which reaches the application? Is this the IDP, the API gateway or the third party key manager? Again, Snap my fingers. The right answer is an IDP, right? Glue is really good at doing IAM and 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 uh, and and managing the scopes and, and really the ecosystem of of all of your clients and, and relationships. Now, again, this is snapping our finger. Let's get there tomorrow. That that's what we could have. I I put this in there. But in reality, uh, if you want a really quick solution, this is one of the benefits of of using you know, an API gateway. An API gateway gives you a lot of the stuff that, that your developers don't have to worry about. So you get an API key, you get rate limiting, you get all this, all this kind of stuff that secures your APIs. And you get that by just dropping in this critical component in front of your APIs and protecting them. And so out of the box, you don't have an IAM. Let's say you don't have analytics. You don't have all the stuff that you eventually need to get to a place where your API ecosystem is considered mature. In the meantime, the API gateway gives you the benefit of being able to use, it's true, a, a less secure uh, uh, mode of, of, of authentication authorization, which is an opaque token. Um, and and uh, and then and then use that today and get value today and then as you grow, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, when you pick up an API gateway like Tyke, uh, uh, we are we definitely hold the mindset that there are IAM solutions that are really good uh, like Glue, and so our job is to integrate with them. Is, is once you get to a really mature place, you've outgrown and outscaled uh, opaque tokens, and, and you want uh, revocation and and OAuth scopes and all that. Well, then now you can kind of, you can drop the the opaque token approach and go with something like uh, OAuth with with glue. Cool. All right. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. I think that's been coming through, and I think you guys have already been <clears throat> answering them. But I'm not sure if everybody it, it is visible to everyone. Uh, so I'm probably going to call out some of these these questions as well um, right from the top. I think Andrew initially asked about 
should we be using um, API keys as actually we had it, in conjunction with JWT tokens uh, for tracking and kill switch? Is that is that a, is that a decent? Is that a good practice? Is that something that should be considered? Yeah, so I, I'm aligned to a, API keys. So let me let me define what I meant. So what I see sometimes mm -hmm. is when I, I'm calling a SaaS provider, they give me what's called an API key, and that's just like a long string. And I present this long string in my authorization header, um, and it gives me access to the API. Um, mm -hmm. But this this key never rotates. It's always the same key. It's good forever, and it never rotates. Um, so that's not an access token. That's cheating. Um, that's just bad security. <laughs> so if you see any of your SaaS providers doing that, um, it's just a lazy, bad security mechanism. Um, um, access tokens are also just a string, but they're short-lived. They're only good for um, five minutes. So if you, the probability of guessing that string, there's, if you look in the OAuth spec, it gives you basically like, you know, I think it's like two to the 32. It's basically, it's, a, it, it's almost impossible to guess this string in the time period allowed. However, if you have a string and you give it uh, people as long as they want, it's very breakable. Um, so, yeah, so... Uh, I don't see those two things being used together. Um, uh, an API key is basically just an access token that never expires. It's a bad idea, in my opinion. Okay. And then finally, I think one more which comes up around is, uh, what about concerns with JWP bloat and inconsistencies across APIs? Is this where something like an API gateway could help out with this? Or um, you know, is there is there another best practice around that? Probably this is going to be the last one for now, I think, last question, but go ahead. Um, so well, right. So the drawback of an I, of a JWT is that it's big, it's signed. You know, it contains the JSON payload, and you can stuff a lot of information in there, and that's going to increase the size of the of of your header for sure. Um, you know, the the good thing about JWTs is they don't need to be introspected, so you save the round trip. Um, if you're really concerned about um, the size of the request, then maybe go to reference tokens, which is just a, a, an unguessable string and will reduce. But yeah, I mean, you can abuse JWTs. You can stuff too much information in there and that that could be bad. So, you know, um, I, I think that's definitely an issue. Right. Okay. Uh, anything, any final thing to add here, Setki? Because I'm just being mindful of time. I think we're about eight minutes. So oh, uh, let's keep going. I'm okay. good. <laughs> uh, Julio, just uh, looking at you as well in terms of you know time. I, I don't know. There is a there is a uh, I think there's a giveaway that is that people are waiting for as well. Um, any final questions? I think there is one question that Louise is asking here, which is how does Glue and Type help with um, personally identifiable information or PIIs uh, between auditing, logging, and good level of privacy uh, or analyzing hacking attempts? Like where does do you come in? Where does Tyke come in? How do we help out with this? I can, uh, I, I'll definitely start there. So just before I answer, you guys say a pop up on your screen. It says, is your enterprise planning centralized authorization? Go ahead and vote yes or no on that. Um, so with, yeah, so what's really nice about Tyke or any API gateway is that it sits in front of your APIs and thus you have a single entryway into all of your um, uh, API ecosystem. And then what you can do is you can drop in hooks and then uh, that Tyke can execute. So for example, you can report all request payloads to an analytics engine and then monitor those for anomalies. You can have Tyke, um, you know, return 403s or 429s or, or what have you on APIs that fall outside of uh, uh, if someone's accessing an endpoint that is not documented or is being deprecated or um, uh, or falls outside of their their, their policy. Uh, so. Again, there, there's so many different things to look at in terms of attack vectors. What's what's really powerful about having the, the doorways? You can monitor all of it from a single place. So think of you know Tyke as being your 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 bodyguard and being able to inspect all traffic and then and then react to them uh, either proactively or or um, you know in flight uh, and then deny request or again ship out everything to let's say Splunk or Elasticsearch or, or Grafana, Datadog, one of these really powerful um, data syncs that Tyke integrates with and then and then set up your anomaly checkers. So th there's there's so many different ways to skin the cat there. Cool. Um, 
I think with that, we might come to a close to the question and answer for now. However, I think if you do have questions that we could not address in today's session, please feel free to keep those questions coming. You can ask the questions after the session as well, and we will get back to you with a response from both of our speakers um, so that you know no question is going to be left unanswered. So we are here to answer your questions, hopefully get some of the, the word out around API security, and hopefully help you make better decisions when it comes to API security and API management uh, in, on an ongoing basis. So with that, thank you so much, uh, Setki and Mike. This has been a fantastic conversation. I think we could probably go on for another hour, maybe more. <laughs> thank uh, you. I have learned so much around this. So thank you so much for the wonderful conversation here. All right, yes. I've got Julio here. So I see you appear on the screen and the exciting uh, end to the session that people have also been waiting for. So go on. <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, before I get to that, uh, just a quick reminder that today's webinar has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of the webinar, you'll be able to watch it again. We will be sending an email with the link to access the webinar on demand, and you can also find it on DevOps.com. Just look in the on-demand section, the webinars page, and it should be there. Uh, and to announce our four winners for the $25 Amazon gift card, our first winner is Kevin D. Congratulations, Kevin. <clears throat> Right, Our please. second winner is uh, Jim B. Our third winner is Simon M. And our last winner is Des V. So congratulations to all our winners. We will be reaching out to you via email with instructions for claiming your Amazon gift card. So please check your inbox. And if you don't see it there, uh, check your spam folder. Uh, Mike, Buddha, and Setki, thank you uh, all very much for taking the time to put this presentation together. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you so thank much. You all. It's been a wonderful conversation. Absolutely. And thank, you, thank you for, audience for participating and for the questions as well. And like, like we said, uh, keep the questions coming. If you want to reach out to us after the session, uh, please do so, and we will address those questions as well. So thank you so much. It's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much, Setki and Mike, as well. Thank you. Of course, uh, this is Julio Godinez signing off until next time. Take care, everyone. Take care, guys. Bye.